What do we really know about the Magi, the three wise men, we call them, who brought gifts to baby Jesus? I get questions like this from my kids all the time, questions about Bible and theology stuff. I love their curiosity. And I often find myself answering them this way. Well, how could we know? I'm asking them a question of epistemology. They've now learned that the answer to this epistemological question, a question about how we know what we know, they need to answer it with the standard Sunday school reply. The Bible, Dad! It seems obvious once stated, but the only way Christians can reliably know truths from biblical history with the kind of certainty we tend to want is if the Bible contains answers to those questions. Or rather, the only historical sources that I am morally obligated to believe and believe completely are biblical ones. Here are eight things we can know about the wise men from the Bible, and just about all of it comes from one very small portion of the Bible, Matthew 2 verses 1 through 18. First, they were magicians. They were magi. The standard Greek-English lexicon, BDAG, defines the magoi, that's the Greek word there, as wise man and priest who was expert in astrology, interpretation of dreams, and various other occult arts. Now, technically, we don't know what magoi means just from Matthew 2. We have to see how the word was used outside Matthew and even outside Scripture. The word shows up in Acts 13 to name a Jewish false prophet, Elymas. The major English translations often call him a sorcerer. Outside scripture, the word has a somewhat unclear reference. D.A. Carson, excellent commentator, says, The term loosely covered a wide variety of men interested in dreams, astrology, magic, books thought to contain mysterious references to the future, and the like. Some magi honestly inquired after truth. Many were rogues and charlatans. But it feels odd calling the good guys sorcerers or implying that they were charlatans. So all the major translations go for either wise men or the transliterated neologistic justified cop-out magi. Second, there were at least two of them. It is generally assumed that there were three wise men, but that is an inference from the number of gifts that they gave to baby Jesus. It's nowhere stated in the text of Matthew. But we do know that the word wise men, or depending on the translation that you're using, I've got the King James right here, the magicians or even magi or astrologers, throughout the passage, that word is plural. So there were at least two of them. And there is no indication in the text of scripture that these magi are kings, just FYI. Third, they came from the east. By now, you may be realizing that Matthew simply doesn't say very much about these wise men. Many interpreters try to fill in the biblical picture by using a clue in the text. That is, they came from the east. These interpreters look at some other wise men from that direction in scripture, the wise men from the story of Daniel, and you'd want to see Daniel chapters 2, 4, and 5. Since Daniel's story occurs in Babylon, and Babylon is in the east, this has led some writers to conclude that the Magi must have come or could have come from Babylon. However, we simply do not know. We cannot know because the Bible doesn't tell us. Fourth thing that we do know, they rejoiced to see Jesus and they worshipped him. The Magi were the first Gentiles to worship Jesus. The first in a long line that now includes me and probably you, most modern Christians. These Gentiles knew somehow, and once again, the Bible doesn't tell us how, that Jesus was the King of the Jews. This was not a fearful but a joyful prospect to these wise men. They were overjoyed to find Jesus, and they fell down to worship him upon finally encountering the child. All the good characters in the birth narratives, the stories of Jesus' youngest days, view it that way, an indication that Christ was coming in salvation and not yet in judgment. Number five, these wise men gave Jesus at least three gifts. The wise men brought a number of gifts for Jesus, gold, frankincense, that's a type of incense that's used in worship, and myrrh, that was a perfume used in embalming bodies. Christians over the centuries have very naturally speculated about the significance of these three gifts. Gold for a king, frankincense for a god, myrrh for Christ's coming burial. Such speculation is 
almost irresistible, and it probably does belong in Christian teaching of the story, as long as it's clearly marked as speculation and not allowed to become a new tradition. Distinguish, in other words, between what the Bible says and what you might reasonably derive from it. The passage doesn't say what significance the Magi placed on the gifts or suggest that they knew enough about the one born king of the Jews that they could give such intelligent gifts. The text simply says that they were expensive gifts. They were treasures. That's what the text focuses on. Number six, Jesus was probably still an infant when they came and possibly a newborn. Though we do know that the Magi came after Jesus was born, we don't know quite when. It is common for evangelical interpreters, at least like myself, to debunk the standard manger scene view to point out that the Magi and the shepherds did not worship Jesus at the same time as it's often depicted in pictures. But we may be able to rescue a portion of that debunked scene. The passage says that the Magi came after the birth of Jesus. And it says they came to the house in Bethlehem where Jesus was. Joseph and Mary had apparently moved on from wherever the manger that was not in an inn was. We don't even know if it was inside or outside. But Jesus was not yet in his eventual hometown of Nazareth. This suggests that he was either a newborn or a six-week-old child when the Magi met him. That's because there are only two events in the Gospels here in the New Testament that tie the baby Jesus to the area around Bethlehem, which is a two-hour walk from Jerusalem. His birth and his dedication at the temple after Mary's 40-day purification. We discover details about that in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 38. We have incomplete data and various harmonizations of the Matthean and Lucan birth narratives are possible. I offer a few speculations in order to distinguish them from what we can know. As fun as speculation is, we must admit, there's just not very much that we can know with certainty about the timing of the Magi's visit. Number seven, coming to the end here. The Magi did not return to Herod. Whatever exotic eastern locale the Magi happened to come from, their return trip did not require them to go through Jerusalem, or at least near Herod. God warned them in a dream, the text of scripture tells us, not to do all this. This innocent action on their part so infuriated Herod that he killed all the little boys under two in Bethlehem and the whole region. The fact that Herod subsequently killed all boys two years old and younger may indicate that Jesus was a toddler when the Magi met him, but it may also reflect a delay in Herod's realization that he'd been tricked and the Magi were not in fact coming back to see him. Or maybe it was just personal peak, covering all his bases by killing all the boys that were born since the time the star appeared. We don't know. Eighth and finally, the Magi, the wise men, may have followed a lost prophecy of Daniel. There is one speculation about the wise men that is based on the Bible, which many serious interpreters of scripture view as plausible. These Magi may have known to follow their star because the east from which they came was Babylon, we talked about this, and the prophet Daniel had left them some messianic prophecy of which we have no record. Daniel was God's tool to make other prophecies of Christ. Perhaps he's the reason for this remarkable portion of the Jesus story. It's important, again, to distinguish what we can know from what we can only speculate about, to keep scripture and tradition healthily distinct. Christmas carols tend to blend truth with tradition, and next thing you know, the baby Jesus doesn't cry. You know, we have that carol, no crying he makes. Another carol that I love says, three ships came sailing in to Bethlehem, which doesn't sit on any body of water. And another carol says that the Magoi were three kings. Traditions are fun, but genuine knowledge is justified true belief. Tradition is not an adequate justification for knowledge about 2,000-year-old events. And there is the ever-present possibility that traditions will actually grow to obscure or even contradict the truth. 
It is entirely possible, of course, that historical sources outside the Bible might mention Jesus or Paul or King David or the wise men or the census slash tax that was taken by Cyrenius when he was governor of Syria. But everything we are justified in knowing about the three kings of Orient comes from the first 18 verses of the second chapter of Matthew.